Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to wherever you are in the world. My name is Andrew Glazer from the Glazer Tutoring Company, and today I would like to teach you how to find the x-intercepts of a cubic function. So, first thing is, what in the world are x-intercepts? Well, pretend you have a function. This kind of looks like a cubic a little bit. All right, and let's identify now what we mean by x-intercepts. Remember, the x-axis is always written horizontally. The y-axis is always written on the vertical axis, okay? The x-intercepts here are going to be the points where the function intersects, crosses, or touches that x-axis. Now, it turns out that you actually know something special about each one of these three points, okay? Now, I, and I'm not pretending that this function exactly is this picture, right? If you want, we can plug it into the calculator and see exactly what it looks like, but I'm going to hold off of that because I want to teach you an algebra method first. And actually, I want to teach you a logical process first, and then we'll get into the algebra. So uh, it turns out that we do know something special about these three points, and what it is is that we know the y values of each of these points, or we know the function's value. Do you know what it is? Zero. Zero, right? You don't know what the x value of this is, so I'm going to put a question mark, but you do know the y value is zero. You also don't know what the x value of that is, but I do know what the y value is, it's zero. You also don't know what the x value of that point is, but what you do know is that the y value is zero. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you is that the x-intercepts will always have a y value or a function value equaling zero. So I'm gonna write that down over here. Now this is a huge idea, okay? Very, very fundamental idea. Because what this is gonna allow me to do is it's now gonna allow me to kind of understand what's going on. So, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to plug in zero for the function's value there, okay? So I'm going to write zero equals now x cubed, x cubed plus 2x squared minus 9x minus 18. Okay. Now, how do we begin to figure out now the values of x that will produce an overall value of zero on the right-hand side? First thing I would suggest is just try to think about it logically. All right, just can you see any value here of x that will cause this right-hand side to become zero? And you're like, my God, I don't know, man. I know it's not going to be zero. I know x can't be zero because if x is zero, it's going to be negative 18, right? And that would be correct, right? Negative 18 is not going to be equal to zero. So x cannot be zero here. You, In other words, your x, the x value of your uh, x-intercept here will not be at zero. It's not going to be at the origin. Okay. So now what we have to do is we got to think about, okay, well, that's not going to work. What do I need to do? The key word here is factor. You got to factor and you got to group elements together. Okay. Elements, I don't mean chemical elements. I mean, this is one element. That's two element. That's three element. That's four element. Okay. We got to start grouping elements together. Now the question is, well, how do you do it? What do you group together? Do you group these two together and these two? Do you group these three together? and leave that one all by its lonesome? Do you group these three together, right? I mean, there's a whole bunch of ways you can do it now. You should try well, maybe a whole bunch of ways. Maybe something will click, okay? There might be more than one way to approach a problem. Now, the best way to approach the cubics is to group it in the following way. What you're gonna do, and I'll change the color here, you're gonna group it into two, all right, two parts. One part being the, f the highest two terms, the x cubed and the x squared, and then the second part being the lowest two. All right, being the x and then the constant term. Now, why does this work out? Well, it just seems to be that the pro the way the problems are given, okay, that's a big part of it. The way the uh, functions are given to us, uh, we're going to find a common factor actually between what's in here and what's in here. That's just by virtue of the of the problems, okay. Now, um, when I start doing this. Okay, I need to, I realize that you might now be looking at the parentheses and you might say, well, wait a minute, are these two multiplied now? There's no sign in there, so that implies multiplication. Yes, it does imply multiplication, and that would be incorrect. I just have to move this over and add a plus sign, okay? Because I'm really adding those two together, basically, all right? And that would be consistent, right? I mean, you're adding a negative 9x, that's the same thing as subtracting 9x, and if you're adding negative 18, that's the same thing as subtracting 18. So, right now we have a very consistent uh, look to this. So what I want to start doing is pulling out some common terms inside of this uh, greenish uh, parenthesis. And I realize that each of these terms has, has a, the highest factor between them is going to be an x squared. So I pull out an x squared term. Let me put the brackets there. Pull out an x squared, right? And what I'm left with is then just an x term here plus this is now just a 2, okay? So I factored that. 
then plus. Put your parentheses down again. And what I'm noticing is that I have a common negative nine term. That's the highest factor in both, right? Negative nine here, and I can pull out a negative nine from there. So I'm going to pull out a negative nine everywhere. God, I love bedtime stories reading to my kids. Okay. Um, so anyway, uh, if I start rhyming just by random occurrence, I do apologize, ladies and gentlemen. But that's how your brain begins to change as you become older. So, um, all right. Anyway, back to business. I pulled out a negative 9 here, right? So I can divide that whole thing by negative 9, essentially, and I'd be left with just x. So you can just write x. Then I'm going to divide this by negative 9, essentially, and I realize that I'm left negative divided by negative is a positive, right? So I'm left with a positive 2. All right? And that should make sense. Negative 9 times x is going to be negative 9x. Negative 9 times positive 2 is negative 18. So hopefully that looks consistent. But now, look. Look, right? What did I tell you was going to happen? Okay? It just happens. It just works out this way. Okay? What happens if they didn't give you an 18 here? What happens if they gave you a 17? Right? Then what are you going to do? Well, first you might make a little doo-doo in your pants, but after that, what are you going to do? I don't know. You're not going to solve it this way, I'll tell you that. Okay? That becomes a lot harder. A lot, 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 lot harder. Okay? You're going to need upper-level math to now figure this one out. Okay? You can always use your calculator. You can always go back to the calculator and use the graph function to help figure it out. But you're not doing this algebraically now, not at, not at this level at least, okay? So, um, it, remember though, it could be side, oh, I gotta be careful now or something. You can solve it though, okay, algebraically. It's just that's not really the point. I'll do other videos on that, okay? But the point here is going to be the problems are going to work out in such a way where they're giving you common factors in there, okay? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin to now pull out this common uh, factor, all right? So let's do that. Let's pull out the common factor. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to pull this out, okay? I'm going to superimpose it on one another because that's kind of how we can think about, you know, pulling out the common factor. And then what's left is I'm going to get rid of these, okay? And I'm just going to now combine these two like this, okay? Just like this. And I got to put a little parenthesis around them, okay? That's how it's going to work. So basically, if I were to if I were to go back a little bit, right, we're just kind of pulling out those factors and then reorganizing them. Okay. So let me go back now. Okay. And our result here was this: x plus two times now x squared plus it was a plus negative nine, right? But I'm just going to write a minus nine just to make it easier. All right. Now. This is equivalent to this, and this was equivalent to this. So, so far, so good. Okay, so far, so good. Now, where do we go from here? This is beautiful now, though, because I now have two kind of binomials, right? And what I realize now is that if this term were, were to be zero, I could care less what this is. In other words, in other words, watch. What does x have to be here in order for this term to become zero? X has to be a negative 2, yes? Okay. If X is equal to a negative 2 here, this whole thing goes to 0, right? This whole thing becomes 0. And if X is minus 2 here, what does this whole term become? Well, negative 2 squared would become a 4. 4 minus 9 would become a negative 5, yeah? But let me ask this question. What's 0 times negative 5? Because that's the operation in between the two parentheses. It's still 0, you see? I could care less what this is. I don't care. I don't care, right? All I want to focus on, because that the whole thing goes to zero, and that's what I want. I would need the function's value at zero. I need to find an x value with a function value zero, okay? So what we're doing is we're kind of breaking this up into two parts, okay? I'm saying to myself, I want this thing to go to zero, and I could care less what this is at that time. And then I'm going to ask myself, well, if this term could go to zero, right? If that term could go to zero, then I could care less what this term is at that time, because if this thing's zero, well, the whole side's gonna go to zero, right? So how do we now write that down, algebra? Now you can just, th now at this point, you can think about it and solve, right? Just like we said that x is gonna be minus two, you can figure out your x values over here, uh, here as well for that to become zero. Actually, test yourself, what do you think it is? What does x have to be here in order for this whole thing to go to zero? What do you think? Right, did you say x is equal to three? Good, and that's it, right? Er Right? Did I catch some of you? I'm sure some of you said, no, 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 Andrew, that's not it. It's negative 3 as well, right? It is negative 3 as well. 
because if you plug in a negative 3 here, negative 3 squared is a positive 9, and a positive 9 minus 9 is going to be 0. So you really have 2, right? So you don't even need more algebra from here. I mean, you can figure it out. These are going to be the factors, ladies and gentlemen, okay? This is what we got going on over here, right? Negative 3 and 3, and then we said x should be a minus 2. So what I'm going to do, I'll show you the algebra, but what I'm going to do is just take these values, put them on up at the top, because <laughs> guess what? We're actually done with technically with the problem. These are the values. Those are the x-intercepts. Okay, but how would we then set it up algebraically? Because if you got to this point, and you just started writing numbers down, right? You're probably going to lose credit because it's like, oh, you know, what are you doing? You're not showing your work, and you're like, well, I thought about it. I thought about it logically. I mean, it makes sense, professor, right? I all I did, all right, plug this in, it makes sense. No, you didn't show the work, so minus seventy, right? You're going to get seventy points off. Okay, you don't want seventy points off. I don't want you to get seventy points off, right? So let's show the work. So what you got to do from here now is you're going to set each of these terms equal to zero. Okay, set that equal to zero on that side. And what you're going to do is you're going to set this equal to zero on that side as well. And what you're doing is you're now solving this equation. You're asking yourself, what does x have to be in order for this thing to become zero, right? Minus two from both sides. I mean, this is elemental at this uh, point, right? X is equal to negative two. Oh, goody gumdrops. Look, it's, it's identical, right? How do you solve this? So you can choose a couple of ways. By the way, I'll show you a quick program in the calculator. And if you want to learn how to program this function, take a look in the description below. I'm going to leave you a link. It's so easy. It'll take you four minutes. You're going to be able to do quadratic formulas in your calculator. Okay? So watch. Uh, when we look at this function, we know the a value is 1. There is no b because there is no bx term. There is no x. And then this is going to be our c term, the negative 9. Okay? So watch how simple this is. Ready? Program. Enter. Execute the quadratic program. Hit enter. Your a value is 1. Your b value is 0 and your c value was negative 9, hit enter again, and look, right? Ne positive 3 and negative 3. That's what we said it was going to be, positive 3 and negative 3 before, okay? It's a beautiful, beautiful little program, all right? Take a look in the uh, description below. Now, you can do it that way. Whoops, what am I doing? Okay. You can do it that way. Um, you know, uh, you can also do it by this was x squared minus 9 is equal 0. You can also realize that that's a perfect square. You know, this is x plus uh, 3, then that's x minus 3, that's going to equal 0. And then again, same logic as what we did over here. Hey, if this thing goes to 0, then this whole side goes to 0, and that would be a true statement. If this thing goes to 0, uh, excuse me, then this whole side would go to 0, and that's a true statement. So you set both of these equal to 0, and you solve, okay? You can do it that way. That's fine. But the other way to do it, which I think is a little easier, just add the 9 on over to the right-hand side, and you got x squared is going to be equal to 9. Now what you can do is just square root both sides, yes? So x is now going to be equal to the square root of 9, and you're going to say it's 3, which is correct. But a lot of people forget that also come what that comes along with this is a negative value, okay? I've seen some discussion. There's apparently some argument about whether you take the square root of a, of a number. Should you get a negative answer? Look, I, I don't really care. All I know, all I know is when I do it, I have both, okay? Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Don't ask me. It's, it's I don't, in any case, we know it should be positive and negative, Okay, so I would always be careful. Whenever you take that square, uh, whenever you take the square root, consider that you should have a positive and negative answer that goes along to it. So you really got two answers here, and that's what we said it should be, two answers, okay? And that's it. That's how you would now show the work. So these are your answers, right? Those are your answers. Now, hopefully this makes sense, but I know some of you, right, might be saying, all right, this kind of, this made sense. I got this. I got this, but you know, something's not clicking. Well, watch. Look at a picture, okay? Now graph this thing. Right? This has a certain graph to it. This, this math function has a picture that goes along with it, and it's kind of beautiful. The picture, it's going to be a coordinate system, right? And every point along the coordinate system is going to create a beautiful curve, meaning if you plugged x in, you know, if you plug, excuse me, 1 in for x, you get a certain function value, you plot that point. If you plug 2, you get a certain point, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The whole graph is going to begin to look like this. Well, let's see. Ready? x cubed, so x cubed. Hit the over button, bring it down, plus now 2x squared. All right, then it's going to be minus 9x, and then it's going to be minus 18. Now, I'm going to go to zoom standard, so there we go, and here it is, okay? Now, you can imagine part of it's cut off, but quite honestly, it doesn't really matter, all right? What's important are the x-intercepts in this thing. So remember, this is going down, then it comes up here, then it goes all the way down. It's going to make some loop-de-loop -loop at the bottom and then come back up, right, to continue. But what's important are the x-intercepts, right? That's what we're after in this problem. So look, this is where it crossed the x-axis, this is where it crossed the x-axis, and then this is where it crossed the x-axis. Every tick mark represents one unit. So if you counted to the left three units, then the x-coordinate of that point is going to be negative three. And the y-value, remember, was zero. 
Wait, that's what we said. What is this? The x coordinate there, negative 2. Wait, that's what we said. And what about this one? Well, the x coordinate's going to be 3. Wait, that's what we said. You see? You can also use the calculator to help you out with this. Okay? Now, you might say, well, I'm not allowed to use a calculator, or I can't show that as my work. That's fine. What you can do is you can graph it, get the answers, and then you can try to reverse engineer the problem. All right? It depends on what you have available to yourself. You can also now go to the table function and really just see them. Right? Go to the table function. Now go to your calculator. Oops. Go to your calculator. Hit second graph to bring up the table. Okay? Now, look. Notice here... We defined the x-intercepts to be the location, the values of x, where the y's are zero. Yeah? So what are the what are the values? It looks like we have negative three. It looks like we have negative two. And it looks like we have three. Negative three, negative two, three. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for tuning in. I really do appreciate it. All right, I do hope this video helps. I'm just going to back out of this so you can see all the beautiful work. And if this did help you out in any way, if you don't mind giving us a hand, I'd so appreciate it. All right. Like, subscribe, hit those buttons. And if you can, even more importantly, tell some of your classmates, tell some of your friends. All right. If they're taking the same class and even if they're not, and if you are in other classes, by the way, we have physics videos out there. We have chemistry videos out there. We got thousands and and thousands of videos to help you through your class solved via specific problems, all right? We got specific problems out there. So you can do a ton of practice, and then you can always check yourself. No matter what physics class you're in, it doesn't matter if you're in physics at X university or Y university, right? You're still taking physics. And the, equa the problems you're going to be seeing are very similar amongst different universities. So what you can do is you can go to our uh, web, uh, excuse me, you can go to our YouTube channel, you could actually also download the OpenStax textbook for college physics, and you can start doing problems there. If you're not sure how to approach it, check out our video. I got a solution out there for you. Okay, show you how to do it, just like I showed you how to do this one. Thanks for tuning in.